Welcome to Catholic in America. Can a Catholic vote for Kamala Harris? Stay tuned. Well, welcome back to Catholic in America. And today we're talking about voting your conscience. And so the question, obviously, to you two is, Father Michael and Father Tom, you're going to vote for Trump or you're going to vote for Kamala? <laughs> <laughs> what uh, is that's your only for our say? Patreon. That's only for our Patreon subscribers. So that's if you subscribe right, right. on Patreon, we'll tell you. <laughs> I'll tell you who. I'll tell you who Father Tom voted for in the in the past four elections. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So, well, I mean, you know, but you know, I mean. Does it matter? I mean, does voting matter? I mean, that's kind of the question. But it's kind of like voting for the high school student body president. You know, he gets up there and he says, we're going to have longer recesses or, you know, we're going to have uh, chocolate milk and not just white milk. I mean, you know, how important it really is it to vote for, and as crazy as it may sound, the president of the United States. How important is this? <laughs> well, regardless of how important it is and the impact that we have, uh, all Catholics have a moral responsibility ah. by the fourth commandment and the teaching of the church to vote. <laughs> so whether or not we believe it's important or not, we are morally obliged to be engaged in civil society I, and making a positive impact. I, I would I would say we're obliged to participate and be a force for good, that does not necessarily mean that you have to vote. I, that, that, that would be my contention there. The church does not say that you have to vote. It says you have to be involved positively in civic life and the building up of a more just society. So voting being a part of the ways that we can participate in that. that that's, that's my reading of that. I don't want people to say that, you know, that Father Tom told them and Father Mike did not, Michael did not respond that if they don't vote, it's a mortal sin. So yes, well, I'd say that in, in our society, I don't see how you can do that reasonably. And I'm I'm pretty sure that actually the USCCB has put out things on the moral imperative to vote and to be engaged. But uh, we can look up that, that later. But I would still say, you definitely, we need to be involved because it is our moral duty to be a force for good and yes. to make sure that we are uh, promoting the common good. And the, the way that the common citizen promotes the common good in America is by showing up and plugging your nose and <laughs> choosing your candidate. Yeah. <laughs> That's your but, point. But wait a minute. But, but to, to push that a little bit further, what about if you're in a state like, well, you know, I lived in the state of Alabama for 15 years. And I can tell you now, my vote did not matter in the sense of we knew who was going to win the state. I mean, the, the state of Alabama was won by 75 to 80 percent Republican almost every single uh, presidential election. And so for someone like like, let's just say someone like me, who's uh, who was maybe like, I don't know if I even want to vote in this uh, presidential election. I'm not saying I did say that. I'm just saying if, if someone like me were to say that. Um, you know, what What moral imperative do they have if they already know what the outcome is going to be? I mean, why Why shouldn't they just hold their nose and say, you know what, I'm not going to vote at all? I would say just, just to answer to that, because as we're seeing in Florida, um, we have another show on this topic that there are amendments on, on the ballot as well. There's local government that, that's there. And local government, um, it, it adds up. You might be like, oh, it doesn't matter who the, you know, the, the superintendent of schools is. But <laughs> as we saw as a country this past year or past several years, I should say, you know, throughout the uh, COVID and, and lockdowns and um, everything else that who's in charge of the schools, who's in charge of your state, who's in charge of your city, all those things matter. And it's important to get to uh, not just to be outraged. I think a lot of times we, we reduce getting informed, being outraged about stuff, uh, but to be informed informed about things and informed about what candidates stand for. Um, so even if, if the presidential candidate is a wash where you live, um, or even as you're, as you're looking at how, where our two major candidates stand on the issues, um, which we have two very interesting choices uh, for, for as the, two, the, the top two uh, 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 parties this year, um, that, yeah, that, that, that your engagement in that way still does matter and still can make a difference. Again, voting no on Amendment 4, we would say, would be an, a moral imperative um, even if you just leave everything else blank um, right. on, on, and on the ballot in Florida this year, uh, just because that that's such a, an important thing for us to try to strike down because it's 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 a huge power grab. So I would say um, that that paying attention to the other things that are on the ballot and that that maybe should be enough of an inspiration yeah. for you to, e to get informed did, and show even, up. Yeah, even if you didn't vote for president, 
at least yeah. paying attention to the ballot. You, you at least need to go out and, and vote. That that's a very important thing. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I, I imagine putting someone from this year back in say nineteen seventy six when you had uh, what was it? It was uh, President Carter and who was the uh, Republican then? I can't remember who the Republican then is. Can you imagine how boring of an election that would be compared to what we have now? I mean, no one could even go back in time and be like even interested. I mean, if this isn't getting you interested in politics, if if you know this Trump or, or Harris is it? But I'm not sure it's a good. I'm not sure it's a good interest. Well, I'm not saying it's good either. <laughs> I'm just saying that if you're really trying to drive people to the polls, and you know maybe conspiracy theory is that this is the way that they're trying to drive people to vote now is uh, having these uh, kind of type of candidates rather than you know the boring old you know candidates we've had in the past. Maybe so. I, I don't know. But um, so so I mean. So when we're, when we're talking about voting, though, and specifically when we're talking about in a state maybe where your vote doesn't count or maybe in a state where it actually Your vote counts. I disagree. I think your vote always counts, regardless of whether it's going to make an a, a, a impact where it's going to change the outcome. But still, your voting voting does matter. Like, it does it does count. Like, And it is also part of being a virtuous, good citizen. Sure, sure. So, sure. Well, and I, they're I, always okay. going to bring up the popular vote no matter what. No matter who wins – they're always going to continue to bring up the popular vote for or against that person as some sort of litmus test of something somewhere to be like, well, they lost the popular vote. So they're not really the president or, or you know, those sorts right. of um, <laughs> unless it's your person, you know, then then, then you, you think that's ridiculous. So. Right. Yeah. So, so then the question has to become when you're placing your vote for for president of the United States. If you place a vote for Kamala Harris as a Catholic, are you going to hell? <laughs> Father Michael? It's a great question. Well, again, so the, the, the church does does teach that there are uh, moral uh, moral absolutes, and some of those um, find their way onto the uh, platforms and the you know the, the campaigns of, of certain candidates. And uh, the dignity of the human person is a moral absolute, an inviolable reality. And when people are taking stands for um, for the intentional, like a positive evil would be be um, you know a positive say, I want to intentionally kill, maim, destroy, torture, uh, nuke uh, the, these these innocent people and, and their lives. And we say that, that that's 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 a moral evil. So we have an ob ob obligation to not um, favor those things in our voting. Um, obviously, it's never just that black and white. It's it's, uh, uh, you know, unlike the amendment for on, on our, our, our that's trying to uh, and a, and a proposed amendment to the Constitution that candidates stand for a wide variety of issues. So it's important to know, OK, for things like abortion or things like euthanasia, um, things like um, um, in vitro fertilization, which leads to the um, the creation of thousands, if not millions of, of unborn human lives, oftentimes which are discarded, half of which at least are discarded or destroyed, which leads to life being created so that it can then be destroyed. Um, which, which, by that, the way, there's there's not a real difference between these candidates on that one, for sure. For um, IVF specifically, IVF. right, there, exactly. There's not a real difference there, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so kind of recognizing that like, yeah, the, those, those things are, are, um, are really important. And, and so if you are voting for a candidate and this is what the church would say on this for a candidate in support of those sorts of intrinsically evil issues, then, then that's something sinful. Um, and, and, uh, again, sometimes people are voting in spite of issues or in spite of things. And, and that, that might be a, a different way and that might mitigate some of the moral culpability, but to recognize too, that you have to have a, um, comparative good, um, within that. And what's, what's a comparative good to the taking of an, of an, of an innocent human life? I don't know what is, right. um, so anyway, so, so the church is pretty, is, 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 does not say, cause, cause again, it's complicated across different countries have different laws in these areas. And you have certain countries that, um, you know, abortion's not not being debated, but they're debating whether or not Christians sh should be allowed to exist in their country or whether women should have the right to vote um, or whether people who are, you know, in, in, if you're in China, whether the, the Uyghur Muslims should be put in internment camps or not. You know, obviously, they're not really voting in China. Um, but, you know, so so kind of yeah. recognizing that the church um, can't like take a, a uh, specific stance on each political party and each um, politician 
as well. But but when people say vociferously from their campaign and from their uh, from their commercials and from their stance and from their policies and from their stump speeches that they are in favor of a positive moral evil, we have to take them seriously and say that okay, I I cannot support this positive moral evil. Does that therefore mean that I cannot support and vote for this candidate? That that that, that needs to be seriously considered, and our, that should our our conscience should be coming into play there. So, Father Tom, are you going to hell if no, you the conscience? Trump? Father Tom, are you, <laughs> so going, to, are you going to help you vote for Trump? Yeah. Uh, depends yeah. on why you're voting for him. Right. Yeah. If you're voting for him and because of the positive evils that he supports, and there's a few of those out there on, on the platform. That's the whole point is like the Republican platform and our Catholic faith um, are not perfectly in sync. Like the official platform, especially actually the recent movement of the Republican platform to kind of distance themselves uh, from abortion specifically um, as their first as their official movement as a party platform, which was at the uh, at kind of uh, uh, former President Trump was behind that. And so like that's the, that was the thing is like they were trying to reach out to more voters, make themselves more appealing. And so they kind of softened the Republican platform, even softened on abortion, particularly yeah. um, that particular stance. But then there's also um, the uh, even things that are, again, a little bit more controversial, but also not as black and white, which is like the death penalty, as well as uh, even the uh, immigration and things like that. When you Trying start looking control. at the Catholic Church. Yeah. yeah so like, that's the thing is like the church is not for open borders uh, immigration, but I mean, the church does say that, that immigration and things like that are important issues and that countries have a right to protect their borders and to limit people who come in as well as respecting the rights of people, the fundamental rights of people. So like, but that's the thing is like, when you start look, comparing the Republican platform to the actual teachings of the church, it's not a clean cut. Okay, well, the Catholic Church is the the Republican Party is the is the Catholic Party because actually traditionally the Democratic Party until the 1960s 70s when you had the sexual revolution and the abortion stuff the the Democratic Party was predominantly the Catholic Party right mm-hmm. right it was only the uh, Abortion and then likewise all the cultural war stuff, which has kind of shifted this perception that the Catholic Party is the, is the Republican Party. But that's not the case. Like the Republican platform, as well as the Democratic platform, like there's certain things that are troubling about both of those platforms from a moral Catholic perspective. And that's why the church, when looking at voting, says that you need to every single person and going to Father Michael's point which is that like we're also looking at multiple systems of government across the whole world because we're not just the American church. We're the Catholic, universal Catholic church, which takes into quite wide varieties in government. And so we have to, we give general laws or general rules um, for how people are to act. And so in, in correlation with the fourth commandment, which is about honoring one's father and mother, which goes beyond just your physical father and mother, it's your fatherland and your motherland, as well as to promote the good of the family, of the national family, Catholics are required to be good citizens to keep the fourth commandment. So in that, we say, well, how do I vote? Like, can I vote for Trump? Can I vote for Harris? Can I vote for, can I vote for myself? Can I write my name on the ballot? <laughs> right. Can I put Mickey Mouse? Like, who do I want to vote for? Yeah. And how do you vote? Well, you vote according to what the church says. You are called to vote according to your well-formed and informed conscience. So what do we mean by that? Exactly. Well, yeah. There, what I've seen is uh, there seems to be like this this some point where in the 1960s, 70s, like there was this push of uh, the primacy of conscience that you have to vote according to your conscience. And so like that's what I've, I've heard my entire life and I've heard. But that's the thing is like when we're talking about the conscience, we're not just talking about an informed conscience. Because an informed means that you're informed, you're aware of the issues the major issues in your local area, as well as the national issues, like the important issues, you need to have an informed conscience. So that means you need to read or you need to be involved. You need to have a basic understanding of what's going on. So you're informed. So you're not just showing up at the ballot box and you're just like, well, I'm, I don't know. I'm just going to I'm just going to Christmas tree it. <laughs> I'm just going to just going to I'm just going to choose a bunch of random people and, and pray that the Holy Spirit's going to going to guide my hand. That's not what the church is saying. Yeah. It says, does no, it mean, read. Re- does it mean reading more than Twitter? Yes, it means reading more than Twitter. It means having a basic understanding of who the candidates are and what the issues are, right? So you're informed. But then the second quality is that you have, as Thomas Aquinas says, a well-formed conscience. 
and going back to what Father Michael was saying earlier, like this is where your conscience has to be well formed by objective truth. Mm. And that's why you know, and that's why the you know what is the most important issues. And what, before you can talk about finances and economics and housing and things like that, you have to be alive, right? That's the primary purpose of government. Primary government is to protect the common good. And the first, the first value that we have to have is that people have to be alive in order to participate in society, right? And so right, that's why you- life issues, and that's not just early, that's not just early developmental issues in terms of abortion, although that's probably the most, that's the most important Right. Mm -hmm. In terms of just the beginning, because you can't have an end if you don't have first the beginning. Right. So you have you have beginning of life issues, which are also you're also dealing with innocent people. So you do have this this question of like life is one of the most primary, if not the primary purpose of which we have to first evaluate. And that's why you go from beginning of life to end of life, which is one of the reasons why the USCCB, as well as the Catholic Church, has come out and not just anti-abortion, but also anti-euthanasia. Yeah. Right, because we say yeah. that all life, from natural conception to natural death, has value and dignity and needs to be protected, and that's part of the job of the society is to protect life in all of its forms. And it winds and up like being before- an American value too. I mean, because you know what what is it said? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I mean, life is the first one, so it fits. Yeah, it's not it's not the pursuit of happiness. It's life. You got to be alive. You got to right. be alive in order in order to exercise your rights. Sure. Right. Yeah. So that's why, well, like, understanding, yeah. right, having a well-formed conscience, because here's the other thing. Thomas Aquinas talks about the conscience and that sometimes people magically think, well, I'm just going to follow my conscience. Well, if you're looking at the Catholic understanding of conscience and just a reasonable understanding of conscience, there are people who have what's called malformed consciences, that their, their consciences have not, been, have not been formed. And that's the thing is, like, the conscience is not some magical object that all of a sudden God gave to us, and now we're infallible, and everyone's conscience is infallible. No, you can have a conscience which is maladapted or malformed. Mm. You can have an evil conscience where you justify and use reason to justify evil and basically legitimize evil. And if you have a malformed conscience, Aquinas says you should not follow your conscience. Right. You need to you need to adapt your conscience to objective truth. Yeah. Well, it also and so it, that's it, why it, the thing is like you have to have a well-formed conscience and that's why like we have the teachings of the church, scripture and basic reason to show us like what is reasonable, what is not, like what is good, what is evil. And that's why we have to fight for the good and we have to avoid and fight against evil. So, so this is an important insight, Father Tom and Father Doug, both, just because I think this comes up a lot, not just with voting, but in, just in basic morality that, uh, you know, you're called to follow your conscience, that I think we have a misunderstanding to think, because conscience, properly understood, cannot decide whether something is good or evil. That's the moral, that's the moral law. That's, that's the natural law. That's the law of God. Like, that's what decide conscience is my then interaction with that with this moral good that's put before me how am i called to act so that's 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 so i can't my conscience can't decide that abortion is okay my conscience can't decide that nuclear war is okay my conscience can't decide that torturing this person in this circumstance is okay the church would say that those are intrinsic moral evils i can't my conscience say like well uh but this is actually good it can't do that It, it, it is incapable of creating that so in a sense Conscience then has to say, this is the objective moral teaching according to scripture, according to tradition and natural law, the philosophical tradition of, of the church. And, and so that I need to conform my conscience to that because then I can make a moral judgment basically saying like, okay, I've got these two candidates. One of them is in favor of, let's say, unfettered and, and federally um, mandated or, or paid for IVF and in, in favor of, uh, you know, other things. Another candidate is also in favor of IVF, but, but, um, and is also in favor of um, uh, un, totally unregulated abortion access. Okay. How do I decide between those things of these two candidates? If I, if these are the two major candidates in a two party system, can I vote for either one of them or should I vote for one because it's the lesser of the, of, of the two evils there? Like that, that's, that's where the conscience needs to struggle with it. And it can't say that IVF is okay because, because right. there's an objective moral norm there. It can't say that, that, you know, uh, 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 enslavement of immigrants is okay <laughs> or, or, you know, so yeah, there, there, there's certain, Which there's certain the things there. Candidates right now are saying that we should enslave immigrants. No, 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 neither one of them are, <laughs> but it's interesting too. Cause this also then gets into the aspect of, um, 
people put up, you know, moral norms the church talks about. Like the church talks a lot about the environment. Pope Francis wrote Laudato Si about our care for creation, our common home, how important that is, how essential it is for governments and societies to be working to have sustainable uh, resources and energy and work towards, uh, you know, uh, you know, less greenhouse gases and all these different things. Um, but to recognize, too, that that those are questions of policy. Those are questions of prudent, prudential judgment, um, because every every decision you make is going to have other effects. I can say like, well, therefore, I should recycle. It's like, yeah, you can recycle. And there's other effects of recycling, too. There's going to be a truck that's going to come pick up the recycling and that's going to put out gases in, <laughs> into the atmosphere is I can weigh out is is what, what I'm doing. I'm not telling people not to recycle here, but I'm just saying right. that to say that it's not like a clear um, should I, you know, uh, like when it comes to immigration well, or when that, it comes to and that's to, why that's why the, with the conscience objectively speaking um as we're going back to your question father doug the conscience objectively speaking looks at various different things and evaluates their moral weight and the moral weight of something differs depending upon what it is so mm -hmm. if you're having environmental issues like that that affects a lot of people right and that's about the quality of life as well as obviously sustainability of long-term life so like that is a life issue Right, it's not. It's it's direct. It's indirect or or slightly direct. But you, but likewise, when you have recycling, recycling doesn't have the same moral weight as euthanasia. Right, one of them has greater moral weight. One of them is heavier. It's a heavier topic. It's also why mm -hmm. we don't like to talk about it, right? Because the heavier topics are the ones that, right are harder to talk about because they're more difficult to deal with. But that's the thing is like when you have the moral weight of something, something which has greater moral weight, which is that there's an ontology, there's a hierarchy of weighted issues. And that's why going back even to like the foundation of America, like we recognize that before we can get to liberty and the pursuit of happiness, you have to have life right. after life is then liberty. And after liberty is the pursuit of happiness. Right. right? And that, that's why if you flip the moral weights, and the objective weight of an issue and you equate them that's the problem is like in the world that we live in today many people equate they make the same the various different issues and they're saying well immigration is the same as abortion no those are two different categories like those are two different right. things of greater moral weight they both have moral weight to them and they're both important issues right but you're also looking at what eight to twelve million people right coming in through immigration and immigrants in america today at some point, again, that's off the top of my head, versus 65, 70 million yeah. dead children due to abortion. So like, you're looking at both categorical weight, but also numerical weight. So like, you have the actual weight. You have an innocent person, an innocent child, right, versus a person who is trying to find a better pursuit for their happiness in per terms of immigration versus you have a child. So the, the child is of greater gravity. It's heavier, yeah. right? And therefore, it's also why... When you're looking at various different questions of weight, this is one of the reasons why the conscience is meant to evaluate and look at those different things of greater weight and lesser weight and say, okay, what's the most important? And you start with the most important. Right. And that's why making a well-formed and an informed conscience um, is able to evaluate those things. And I think what I hear you both saying is, is that, you know, it's not the conscience that informs the law. It's the law that informs the conscience and then allows me to, to view these issues based on having a, an informed, a formed conscience rather well, when, than when we, when we say law, we mean, we, we mean divine law and natural law. Not like the law of the United States of America. Correct. So yeah, Sorry. so, the, yes. so the, the law should be informing the law properly understood and kind of, you know, what Thomas Aquinas would say. Yes. Divine law if you have faith, but natural law if you don't have faith, because natural law can be perceived by reason and reason alone. Mm -hmm. So so speaking of that, how should our faith impact our involvement in politics? I mean, because we're, we're talking about this now, especially with us being Catholic priests and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, who our audience is. So, uh, I mean, because we're, we're told, you know, in, in the secular sphere that our, our faith should not impact the way that we view politics or greater society, that that's, uh, you know, that's um, Christians pushing their morals or pushing their own faith and teaching on other people. And, and you can't do that because... I mean, without saying, they're saying this is a personal preference of yours, as opposed to looking at objectiveness, which is in a secular society doesn't necessarily take anything or we don't really know what's being taken into consideration. 
it is still being taken, you know, it's still taking our backgrounds and what we bring to it in consideration. So how how should someone with faith be involved in politics and particularly in the public square? I love I love the line that, that Jesus said of render under, render under Caesar what is Caesar's and render render under God what is God's give to Caesar what is Caesar's give to God what is God's and he's talking about paying taxes and that so at, at the time kind of a religious question of should we pay taxes uh, because this is a corrupt evil pagan government that was ruling uh, Judea at that time which was the Romans um, to say like should we give the, you know give Caesar uh, money to support his is basically his continued subjugation of our people. And Jesus is saying like that Roman coin that you guys use for money, you're perfectly fine to take when they give it to you. Um, if that's his, give it to him. But what belongs to God is belongs to give back to God, which is us. So I would say our role in a society, particularly in a society where we have basic freedoms um, institute or, or enshrined by law, recognized by law, we would say those, those freedoms are God given, not government given, um, that we have an obligation to stand up for not only our own autonomy, me free free exercise of, of of life and free exercise of, of our faith but also to stand up for other people so as part of a society um yeah our, our faith tells us and our faith informs us and commands us uh to to participate and it should be it should be something too that's that if if god help us if i thought the government was the highest form of authority like what a terrible, sad world to be in. So praise God, we have Christians in our society. Praise God, we have Christians in America. And America not, might not not be a Christian country um, uh, properly, you know, so-called. We're not a theocracy, um, though some people, you know, claim we are anytime any sort of believing person gets elected. They're like, oh, see, especially if they believe and practice their faith or, or have policies different than what you believe. People are fine if you if you bring God into it as long as you are, are supporting their policies. If you're a liberal Democrat and you bring up Jesus, this, like, uh, you know, President Joe Biden has done continuously. He doesn't speak or, or appear in public anymore, but he, he's done continuously talk about his Catholic faith and people that are liberal are totally fine with that. Um, uh, but people on, on who are conservative absolutely hate it and despise it and get frustrated by it. And uh, and as a Catholic, there's definitely aspects of that that I get very frustrated about when he flaunts his, his so-called Catholicism as he stands for abortion. But then on the other side, when President Trump holds a Bible or says something that he loves two Corinthians and stuff, uh, you know, Republicans and, and right-leaning people are perfectly fine. They're, they love that. They, just, they applaud it. And and uh, people on on the left, you know, talk about you got to get these 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 poisonous religion out of out of out of society and this evangelical scourge or whatever it is so again it, it, it people are fine as long as it supports their policy so God, people are okay with god being in politics or religion being in politics as long as it is a pawn of their of their preferred political system and um i think as, as followers of jesus we can't be we, we should not be pawns uh we should be we're kings and queens by our baptism so we should be right. moving and shaking in society and affecting change yeah, well, I'd say that also, and jumping off of that, is that our Catholic faith is only going to make, and if we use our Catholic faith correctly, it's only going to make our country better, right? Not because we're imposing things upon things, but because we're just, we believe in, we believe also in, in that our faith is reasonable, like that the things that we believe are not unreasonable. It's not just based upon the Bible. It's based upon good reasoning skills. And so, like, that's why we can use what's referred to in the pagan world or by in Aristotle by as natural law. So like we don't believe that the laws that we're trying to that we're trying to f shape society around are unreasonable, but we believe that this uh, equates with comment with basic reason. And so at the same point, the <laughs> United States, the separation of church and state, it was the separation. The purpose of that originally was to separate and to make sure that the that the state did not interfere in the matters of the church. Right. Mm -hmm. It was not to say that the, that the church and, and people with faith are not to interfere with the affairs of state. Right. Like that's complete. That's a complete reversal and a complete misunderstanding of actually the separation of church and state as it was originally by the founding fathers, right? Because all of the founding fathers they didn't want to adopt a state religion, but they all were believing persons who believed that their faith highlighted and would make their country better. Whether or not there was they were Protestants or whether there there was of the two founding fa founding fathers who were Catholics, right. um, which Charles Carroll was the brother of the of the first bishop of the United States, John Carroll. Mm -hmm. But so like when you're looking at that, like the separation of church and state, it's, it's this newfangled idea of, of that 
which is more recent, which is coming more from atheist-minded persons who want their faith to be the faith of the nation. Because atheism, if you're trying to promote an atheist society where there's complete separation of people of faith and their ability to make an impact in their, in their country, then they become second, second-class citizens. Mm -hmm. Right. So like Catholics definitely need to vote their conscience and according to their conscience as the church dictates. But that's the thing is like the church leaves a wide variety of room for your personal preference and what you believe. It just does say that there are certain moral issues that you have to be aware of and that you can't just throw them aside. And you can't say that there that these things like uh, abortion, euthanasia. Uh, various different types of when you're talking about the creation of life, like cloning and things like that. These are very important issues. And before we start talking about mammon economics, we need to make sure that we are first protecting life of all people because that's the common good. Right. And so like, that's why like our faith, like we definitely need to vote according to our consciences, but making sure that we know and that's why I would encourage all Catholics, especially who are listening to this, but even if you're not Catholic, like look at the issues and recognize like which of these issues are most important. Mm -hmm. And like you can always tell an issue is most important because it's most fundamental. Mm -hmm. Right? Because before you can talk about, about who's better for the economy, we have to have people who are alive. Mm -hmm. Right, right. <laughs> right. Well, right. well I, I would I would say too, along with that, the, like pay attention to what candidates Pay attention to what they say. Let's take them seriously what they say. If they say they're in favor of positive moral evils, um, then we have to take them seriously. Be like, all right, this person is in favor of something that, when I say a positive moral evil, I don't just mean like a downstream effect. Like, you know, uh, six, you know, 65 million babies aborted is different than 7 million immigrants because we're not talking about 7 million, intentionally killing 7 min, million immigrants. If there, was, if there was a party that was saying we should execute anyone who sets foot on the border illegally, like we, without trial, that, that that's 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 a, that's a positive, not like like you know, it's not like a good, but right. it's a moral, it's a choice towards a moral evil. So so again, it's using using kind of a moral category for that. Um, but to have a policy that says, okay, we're gonna we're gonna enforce laws where people come across the border illegally in a certain way, or we're gonna choose not to enforce them, or we're gonna give amnesty to them, or we're gonna say, okay, every person that's here, we're gonna send them all back to the country they came from, or we're gonna say uh, that okay, the people that came in the last five years, we're going to give them jobs, whatever it is. Those, those are prudential d decisions, but it has to recognize, first of all, the fundamental dignity of those people and hold that intention with the laws of the land, with uh, resources, all those other things. Um, so just kind of recognizing. So it's not saying it's one or the other, you know, like, you know, 65 million or 7 million, which this number is higher. Um, but it is, it is for us to recognize, okay, our decisions do have an impact and effect. Like we, when we talk about the environment, like when we talk about economics, but fundamental, as father Tom said, the, the fundamental is this a violence against, against uh, a human person? Is this a violence against the most fundamental cells of society, which is the family? Then that needs to be, uh, that needs to be a priority for us. And, and I, I think, I, I think we, don't, we don't have to apologize in saying that. We have, to, we have to stand for it, not because we're single issue voters, but because we recognize that there is no liberty and there's no pursuit of happiness <laughs> without life. Right. Um, and so and yeah. then we can call our candidates, whatever side of the aisle they are on, whatever kind of economic policies they have or, or understandings of government or, or limited government or exponentially large governments, um, we sh should be calling them to say, like, no matter what your stance on government or economics, you should have the the dignity of the human person at the at the forefront. And when you don't, you don't necessarily you don't deserve someone's vote. And and uh, and so then it becomes a, a question of, of who should you vote for and in holding those things in tension. I'd also say this, regardless of who you vote for, <laughs> uh, you're not going to hell. <laughs> I mean, you, you. Only, only go to, you technically, the, the, you only go to hell is if you die in an unrepentant state of mortal sin. So, which is a very, which is a very qualified statement. If you die yeah. in a state of unrepentant mortal sin, mm -hmm. and a mortal sin has three qualities. It's, you've done something which is a grave evil, Right. You did it with full knowledge and you did it with full freedom and you're not sorry. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. A person who who does a grave evil does hits those three categories and is not sorry. Right. And then they die in an unrepentant state of that. Then, yes, that person, we understand God could God. That person chooses hell. It's not that God sends them to hell, but God, they choose hell because they choose separation from God and God's will. So. I don't think that most people who are voting, whether they're voting for a for Trump or Kamala or some third party person, uh, I think that most people 
I don't. I think that some people, and I, I do think that sometimes it's a danger, especially like when the, in the world that we live in, like people who do decide in their conscience that they're voting for another person, right? That, that I have seen that happen, and I think it's unkind, and it's also unjust when people are like, "Well, you voted for this person over here, and therefore you're a bad Catholic," or things like that. You don't know what their what their discernment went into it. They might have had good discernment, they might not have, but that's the whole point. Like when you're judging another person's conscience and saying you're going to hell because you voted for a, con- a candidate, that's not the Catholic position. Right. 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 Because you don't know how they weighed and maybe they maybe they made a stupid mistake or maybe they made maybe they made an, an uh uh but you don't know. And that's the whole point. Like you can't judge another person and say they're going to hell. And that's sometimes like in the, especially in this polarized hyper emotional society that we live in where people everything becomes uh kind of apocalyptic like it's the end of the world like no it's not it's not the end of the world it's just gonna be a really bad four years maybe <laughs> so right, right but you're not but I, I think it's also important that we don't we don't castigate and we don't uh condemn people because we might fall into a difference of opinion on who who the person to vote for is yeah i have strong opinions and i'm i know who i'm gonna vote for but i'm not saying that i i can't understand why another person would choose to vote for a candidate who i disagree with and that maybe that person is yeah. following their conscience to the degree that they are. And I would say too, that, uh, something else, because in a sense getting, you know, those fundamental issues are so important. And so recognize that there's other issues at stake here too. There's other things um, that, you know, the people that we elect impact our public consciousness, impact our, how we uh, how we talk about family life, how we talk about, think about how easily uh, our, our country from just what, like 12 years ago, um, 12 years ago, yeah, yeah, legalized uh, same-sex marriage, that that started with with people um, at the executive branch, the vice president at the time, um, who's now president, um, basically is coming out in favor of same-sex marriage. And that was kind of the canary in the coal mine to, uh, to, to do a nationwide push for that. So in a sense, the people that we elect um, kind of set the stage for policy that impacts life. And since we live in a, live in a legal, uh, legal positivist society that, that because uh, we don't talk about morality as a society, because you know, people don't talk, talk about actual natural law anymore, um, that so it just what is legal is therefore good. So recognizing if you're voting for people and saying that they're saying they're going to change laws in a certain way, if they're saying they're going to um, restrict laws that, uh, that defend the right to talk about uh, the church's understanding of marriage or sexuality or unborn life or the dignity of immigrants or anything else, to take them seriously and say that, that's going to affect um, that's going to affect our society. And so, yeah, so I, I would say actually look at policy um, for, you know, because when you get past the rhetoric of either party, there are actual policy stands that they take and actual um, uh, uh, platforms that they have. And uh, we sh- you should say, like, all right, is this is this good for the flourishing of a society or not? And, and, and uh, that's that's worth debating and worth worth having difficult conversations about. Yeah. But, but but Father Michael, I think also what you said, you brought in the other the other thing that the that the church has very clearly said is probably the second most important issue. So the first most important issue is life mm-hmm. and the life of all citizens, which is the very definition of common good. And then the second most important issue is the family. Yes, because the family is the smallest building block upon which society is built. Mm-hmm. And so, if you don't protect the rights of the family, which is also the rights of parents. Right to teach and to educate their young according to their conscience, and, yeah. right? But it's also why a family is composed of a mother and father and their offspring, because that's the only definition that you can have for a, a normal, ordinary, normal, ordinary fabric of society, which is going to be healthy. And so that's the the point being is like the church does has helped Catholics specifically and all Christians who want to look to the church's guidance to help them to see kind of the order of what's the most important issues. The most important issue the church has identified very clearly is the life of all people, regardless of their age, whether they're young or old. So life, family, somewhere up the road is, is money, mm-hmm. right? Because those things, that's secondary, as well as those other lesser goods. They're goods, but they're ultimately they're not the best good. They're not the highest good. The highest good is the most primal, which you have to have life. Then you have, what, the life of the family. And then you might have individual my individual expression of what i want to do and that's why like Mm -hmm. personal freedoms and personal preferences and personal actualization how i want to live my life and my my choices for me that's those are those are secondary secondary goods 
They're not primary goods, they're secondary goods, which is why when you vote, if, if a person does vote and flips that order where you're fl- voting for everyone's personal freedom and actualization, which is the pursuit of happiness before you do life and liberty, right? Then you have the very definition of an inverted con- I mean, of, of an inverted uh, moral system and conscience. Yeah, you have but, anarchy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so uh, just real quick, last thing. Um, I, 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 you guys may have heard this as well, but I've had so many people tell me this is the most important election either in my lifetime or in the last hundred years or in in the you know in the United States history. So you know whether that's over dramatized or not. Um, what would you respond to that person with if they said this is the most important election of our lifetimes and you have to vote for this? The, trying to create that urgency, but what would you respond to? How would you counsel that person? I would say, um, yeah, that that uh, like God's not worried. You know, God's not worried. I, I think I think we can get the right candidates and we can do all the right things and pass all the best laws and we can still go to hell if we have hatred in our hearts. And if we, you know, I, I think if you ask a lot of people on the right and the left who are diehard for their candidates, you know, pro Kamala Harris, pro Donald Trump, um, and and can't see the good in the other person, I think most of those people, they would be perfectly fine with doing whatever it took, lying, cheating, stealing, you know, and making sure no one showed up on election day in order to get to the vote in order to make sure because it's such an important cause and it's so important because I, I feel like once we put like the cause the presidency the election above the dignity of the person next to me the devil's already won there and so uh so to me it's it's saying like you, be passionate be be fiery get get pat you know pumped up about the issues and informed um, and always hold that in concert with the, with the fundamental dignity of the person, especially the person that you disagree with. St. Paul was killed by, under, uh, by Caesar. Um, and I, I love in his letters when he, when he talks about we need to pray for Caesar and pray for those in, in, in positions of government. They hold the power of the sword and quite literally over his head as his head was cut off as, as an enemy of, of Caesar as, as a Christian. And so there's something there. Like I was thinking like Paul wasn't praying for a good uh, emperor to be elected. You know, he wasn't right. like, oh, if we, this next emperor, this next <laughs> emperor election is a really big battle. deal. <laughs> what, <Yeah>. What's that? <laughs> yeah, if we could just get right emperor in there, we could turn yeah. this thing around. Yeah. yeah, it's 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 just recognizing. Okay, yeah, there are huge issues here, and there are there is life issues at stake, which are obviously of fundamental importance. And so we need to pray, we need to fast, we need to to vote, be informed, um, talk to people, um, campaign against uh, intrinsically evil um, things that are on the ballot, like Amendment Four here in in Florida. Um, but but always in, uh, recognizing uh, the good of the other person and the right of other people to disagree with you as well. Yeah, I, uh, I'd say that uh, looking at the upcoming election, is it, is it important? It is very important. I think that our country is, and this is part of the whole thing, that we're obviously in the middle of, of cultural wars, and that's what a lot of, even uh, some, a lot of our episodes and things like that have been on some of the cultural issues and cultural wars, because the values and the ideals of our nation are being... Uh, shifted, defined, redefined. And it's like a lot of the things that we're fighting over in terms of politics and, and so forth is not just economics anymore. Now it's, it's about values and it's about enshrining our values in law. And it's like when you're talking about changing values and, and the ways in which law, I think that we are at a important time in our country. I'm not sure it's apocalyptic, um, or at least not yet, <laughs> depending right. upon the values we enshrine into law. Depends and on therefore, but then, whether we are here. Yeah. Yeah, so if your values are strong, then your nation will be strong. If your values are weak and they're based upon subjective changing norms, then your nation will be weak because those things change. And people have assumed that all evolution and change is good, but evolution and change, there's also de-evolution, which is part of of evolutionary theory, (laughs) if you want to get evolutionary. So like people are like, everything is fluid and changes. I'm like, well, yeah, but there's, 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 there is things that are becoming better, but then there's also a movement backwards. And the problem that I see is that we're kind of moving backwards in terms of values and morals and, and the things that make nation strong. And so I think that I don't know if it's the, it's definitely not the end of the world, but it's, I mean, the, the upcoming election is, is very important because you do have two very bipolar opposites 
in terms of the two major choices that most people are going to be voting for, which is obviously uh, former President Trump and then uh, uh, Vice President Harris. I did hear that uh, that uh, Emperor Putin, or <laughs> also known as President Putin, came out in uh, support of Harris. <laughs> I think he was more sarcastic than anything else, as he was like, she has an infectious laugh. She thinks that everything is great and good, so I'm, I'm happy for her. And apparently Donald Trump was, I don't know if he would be insulted or to thank him. Uh, <laughs> so... I think that we do have these two kind of these bipolar opposite persons. Yeah. I, th- I But I think that also recognizing that both of them are flawed. Both of them are human. It's just the question is, which of their platform issues do we agree with more? And especially when you start looking, which of the platform issues, which are most important, uh, that's the way that I'm going to vote. And I would encourage other people to vote according to a well-formed and informed conscience, which is to look at as many of those core issues and then to, to uh, simply evaluate that Um and that's where you just have to kind of do the do the math yourself. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you guys for uh, this uh, important conversation as we're coming up here on the home stretch of the presidential election. And I hope that this uh, that this video that we just made um, not only helps you now, but it helps you down the road uh, as we have more elections that'll come. Uh, this probably isn't the end of the world with there probably is going to be uh, there probably will be more elections and so as we uh, come up on those uh, please come back and refer to this and so uh, again thank you for uh, joining us thank you for your support if you would really like to support us please like share and subscribe this video or you can support us on on the patreon app and so until next time god bless you 